The seventh film in the Star Wars series, The Force Awakens, is just days away. We're getting closer and closer, can't you? You almost taste it. We're, we're almost there, guys. And in anticipation for the new film, uh, I have been revisiting the uh, Star Wars films previous to it. Uh, I've been watching them in the order in, in which they're released theatrically. So at this point, I have come up upon the uh, prequel trilogy, uh, which I know some people kind of want to put aside, want to ignore, just hope for the best for Force Awakens, but let's let's take a look back at them shall we let's talk about them a little bit uh so i will be talking about the phantom menace for today star wars episode one the phantom menace one of the most anticipated movies of all time um most star wars reviews you'll find are at least in part autobiographical and i find this especially true for the phantom menace like you always hear from people their story about you know i was so excited for this uh, i was counting down the days, I was in line, and blah, 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 and kind of the end portion of that story is always a little bit different uh, for some some people. Uh, some people say, oh, I, I liked it, but now I know better. Um, uh, some people were immediately disappointed, so you get different reactions from other people. So uh, a lot of people, especially about this movie, ten, when, when talking about the movie, can't help but talk about their own expectations. Uh, with with my personal expectations, I, I would probably have to say I didn't really have any. Um, it's kind of weird, like, back in that time, 1999, well, let's say two years prior to that, 1997, when the special edition movies came out, I went to see those in the theater. Um, I was a huge Star Wars fan. I love Star Wars. Um, I, I, I was, like, obsessed, basically. Then I don't know what happened. Two years later, I kind of decided, I guess... Yeah, I was 10 years old when the uh, uh, 20th 20th anniversary special editions came out. Uh, so I was 12 when The Phantom Menace was released. And I don't know, I just got into a, a phase where I thought, oh, I'm too cool for Star Wars. You know, I remember like the movie that I was hyped up about the most was Austin Powers, The Spy Who Shagged Me. But I guess it's neither here nor there. Um, anyway, I didn't end up seeing the movie until maybe about two years later. Um, watching it on VHS, which I suppose is apt, uh, because I grew up with the original uh, trilogy on, on VHS as well. Um, so, and I remember seeing it not really being blown away by it, but not hating it. I, the Phantom Menace, it's, it's never been a movie that I've hated, I'll, I'll tell you that. Um, but then, you know, it just never really, I don't know, uh, stayed with me it never really resonated in any kind of way and I kind of forgot about it a little bit and then I don't know as the years passed I saw it on DVD and now on Blu-ray and with each viewing I, I found I, I kind of like it a little bit better uh, with which each time I see it actually and and having seen it uh, one more time recently in you know preparation for this video I watched it uh, just last night I watched it, and uh, I really enjoyed it. Uh, I did, and I know there's not going to be, you know, not everyone enjoys the prequel trilogies, but I did, and I feel that uh, it does kind of keep true to the overall Star Wars spirit in certain respects, in, in respects of the inspiration from the science fiction serials of Days of Yore, uh, where it's really about going on one little adventure after another and going from planet to planet. And, and that movie, uh, this movie, I think it, it captures that kind of spirit perfectly. And needless to say, with with the original trilogy, uh, one of the, the benchmarks of that trilogy was that they uh, made an attempt to tell these stories with the absolute highest grade special effects possible. Special effects that didn't even exist that they created basically that they set the standard for so you kind of expect no less from the newest movie in the series and uh the special effects here are incredibly elaborate even th this movie it's almost actually it's almost 20 years old itself at this point um so I i'd say the effects really hold up aside from some CGI, which doesn't look that great today, but by that same token, some of the puppets don't look that great, some of the miniatures don't look that great in the original trilogy, but, you know, we kind of just ignore that for whatever reason, I don't know. Um, but I, I think visually, it's it's a stunning movie, and I think it really used the, the most uh, uh, highest grade and elaborate special effects available at that time. Uh, not to mention, at least in this particular uh, 
uh, prequel, unlike some of the others, which went way overboard on the CGI. Um, it, it was able to integrate some really nice sets into the movie and kind of uh, make enhance them, basically, using CGI. And there, there's great costume design in the movie. Like, you think about this movie specifically, um, whether you think back on it with, you know, kind of a fondness or just, you know, close your eyes and think about the Phantom Menace and, and what comes to you. I'd say more often than not, people think of the visuals of this movie. So a visual such as, you know, the way uh, Queen Amidala looks uh, immediately comes to mind. Uh, the camera speeding through the canyons and Tatooine as the pod race is going on comes to mind. Uh, the evil villain with the black and red face immediately comes to mind. So it's, a, it's an intensely visual movie, which I, I highly appreciate, uh, especially since, you know, Lucas kind of attributed uh, the visual style of the original films to the success of, of the original trilogies. Like, you know, well, this is like a silent film. It uh, can be seen all over the world and understood all over the world. And that's why it's such a great movie and, you know, things like that. So I think, as I mentioned in, in the previous, in one of my previous reviews of the original movies, he really honed in on that and almost like obsessed over it. And it was at a cost, I would say. Um, the movie's quite a bit of sizzle, the steak is there, but maybe doesn't taste that good. I hate food analogies, never mind. Um, but anyway, he just doesn't have the flair for characters as you know he once did. Um, the characters here are quite a bit flat, I'll, I'll say for sure, and, and they're kind of overshadowed by the visuals and the overall spectacle of the movie, because it's, it's a busy movie. There's, uh, there's a lot going on, which works to certain advantages, because it's a very entertaining movie, I'd say. Like, I know there are some people who say there's a lot of boring sections in it, which, to be fair, is true true of any of the Star Wars movies, really. Um, but I, I think they kind of section off the important set pieces um, in a very even way, in a way that uh, I think is keep, keeps your attention throughout the whole movie, keeps you entertained. Uh, I, I do think the kind of opening scene with the, the Jedi is, is really good, and... We have uh, Obi-Wan Kenobi, who we know, like, basically, we already know who Obi-Wan Kenobi is, so we don't even have to worry. Ewan McGregor just kind of has to be there, so we don't really have to worry about uh, liking the character, because we already know him. But then we have this new Jedi who we're not familiar with, his teacher, his uh, uh, apprentice, and, and that's... Uh, or not his apprentice, his uh, master, I should say. Um, he's the apprentice. Uh, Qui-Gon Jinn played by Liam Neeson, who I love. I think he's great um, in the movie. And, you know, they're fighting off against the droids. And there's whole stuff, you know, with the text crawl. Uh, blah, 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 trade embargoes, whatever. It's like, that's one thing that people always kind of bring cite as a big problem with this movie. Like, what the fuck is this movie about? Trade embargoes? What? It, what? Um, and I think it kind of serves as proof that... It, if you're going to have an adventure series like this, um, it's so much easier to take take have the story take place in the midst of, of a war as opposed to show the origins of the war, which, I mean, a, a noble effort these prequel trilogy, this prequel trilogy is, I would say, for, from George Lucas, but almost he was, like, setting himself up for failure because, like, unless he was, like, as detailed and, and you know, absolutely... In, inarguably uh, structured in such a way that no one could like poke little holes in it whatsoever then you know he's setting himself up for failure which people love to poke little holes in, in kind of the logic behind the whatever politics of this movie if you could even follow it I doubt George Lucas could even follow it I can't I can barely follow it but you know trade embargoes things like that and you know you think oh that's this is Star Wars this is wars about but in the meantime you know it's like okay trade embargoes it's what are they trying to do, like, a Japan allegory there, sort of, you know, embargoing the oil trade, bombing Pearl Harbor, whatever. Meanwhile, by the way, you have, like, the most, like, racially <laughs> insensitive characters. You have those, like, I guess they're intentionally making the lip sync off because they have, like, Japanese accents and there's these alien things. Like, what? Um, those were, I'll admit, those are bad. But anyway, we have this opening scene. I think it's pretty good. We kind of meet the Jedi and kind of what they're all about. And I think there's a really key scene uh, in, in that, you know, opening, a key moment in, in that opening scene, uh, which kind of calls back to uh, Yoda's dialogue in The Empire Strikes Back, where, you know, he's like, oh, I watched him all his life, never had his head 
on the prison, never just paid attention to what he was doing. Um, they kind of echo back to that, where it's like, Master Yoda said I should be mindful of the future. And Qui-Gon's like, uh, uh, but not at the expense of the present. Which, I think it speaks volumes uh, for, for, for the prequel trilogy, because... You know, I think maybe in a very subtle way, maybe George Lucas is trying to say, just enjoy these movies for what they are. Don't try not to like, pe- it's not a puzzle that you have to piece together. Meanwhile, it's like, this is my grand plan. Everything connects together perfectly. And you're like, what? Um, well, whatever. Um, but I mean, at the same time, you're like, you want to enjoy the movie for what it is. But, you know, once this little rambunctious kid gets into the movie who we're supposed to like, but we know in the back of our head, he's supposed to be Darth Vader. And it's like, whatever, just try to enjoy for what it is and that's what I try to do for this movie I know ultimately they're a very different set of movies than than the original even though they're supposed to connect and have some kind of continuity um but whatever um anyway I think that scene is good is what I'm trying to say and that kind of branches off the whole adventure and they go and fight the robots The, the robots are really cool in this movie I thought um you know, the little uh, attack droids are like, Roger, Roger. Pss, pss, pss. I, I love those things. Um, uh, they escape to this planet, and it, there's these stupid creatures on it, and there's half underwater. And of course, that's where they meet Jar Jar Binks, who kind of gets involved in the story. And Jar Jar Binks. There's no defending Jar Jar Binks. I mean, you just can't. Um, wow. Uh, Mr. Jar Jar Binks! Mr. Big Stereotype! Me ruin the whole movie! Ever has there been such a reviled character in, in the entire, not just Star Wars series, but in movies in general? I don't think so. I'm at best. I mean, he's got to be in a bunker somewhere. He's probably getting death threats still to this day. Poor guy. Uh, leave I'm at best alone, guys, please. Um, and, you know, you kind of think that in, in in one respect, this this character is kind of impressive because this is an entirely, entirely, entirely... CGI character, and you kind of believe he's there. You really do. And, you know, he predates, what, like, Gollum or whatever other CGI characters there were at the time. And it's just a shame that he was as annoying as he was, but kind of, at least if if George can take away any, you know, <laughs> consolation, is that people seem to hate Jar Jar just on his character merit alone and the fact that he's annoying alone not for the fact that he's an unconvincing special effect because there are times it looks like you know photorealistic cgi um so i mean at least there's that but my god is he incredibly annoying um they just try way too hard to make him this funny silly slapstick kind of character and his tongue going out and saying silly things and just being this horrible horrible race, racist stereotype almost, which, you know, just makes you kind of uncomfortable. You're like, what the fuck was, were, were they thinking? Um, who knows? So yeah, not a fan of Jar Jar. I mean, big surprise. I, I wonder if there is any, if there are any people out there who like, kind of like legitimately like Jar Jar, you know, like people who aren't like, you know, little kids or anything, but it's, it, it astonishes me how you just say the name Jar Jar and people will be like, oh, man, what the fuck? Um, but anyway, um, I do like the Qui-Gon character quite a bit. Liam Neeson, really good in his role, and he kind of harkens back a little bit to uh, the Alec Guinness uh, performance in uh, A New Hope in Star Wars 1977, where I would say, you know, looking back on it, uh, even Ewan McGregor, though, there was train spotting and quite a few other movies. He wasn't, like, a huge star, he wasn't a huge name, and, and other than maybe like, you know, we have Natalie Portman in the movie, Natalie Portman in the movie, other than uh, Leon, you know, she wasn't in too much, or what was that movie she was in where she was pregnant and she gave birth in a Walmart or something? Whatever. Um, now she's an Oscar winner, but what I'm saying is, you know, Liam Neeson was probably the, the most uh, kind of accomplished uh, lead actor in the movie. So he does, in essence, have that Alec Guinness type of role to him. So I think he, he brought a lot of that uh, to his performance. He brought a lot of gravity to the performance and maturity uh, to a movie that otherwise, yeah, it, it feels way too kid-friendly um, in, in a lot of parts. Uh, so that's a big problem, obviously. And, uh, you know, one thing that's just undeniable, like, I'm sure you've seen other reviews of, of this movie, Tearing It Apart, which... I can't really do, but, um, 
there's that great review, the, the, one of the most infamous reviews of anything ever was the Mr. Plinkett review, if you recall. And, and he brought up one of the best points was that, uh, you know, look, let's talk about the characters in the original Star Wars trilogy and talk about their traits. And, you know, they have the interviewees and they're like, oh, well, yeah, oh, Han Solo is kind of a rebel, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, like, now here, talk about the characters in Phantom Menace. It's like, oh, yes, it's Queen Amidala. Uh, uh, she has makeup. See? And it's like, it's true. I mean, the characters are a little bit dense. Um, but ultimately, I don't think it uh, ruins the movie. There are a lot of, again, a lot of great uh, set pieces in the movie that I found uh, exciting and, and spirited and adventurous. And, and that's ultimately what you want to see in a Star Wars movie. Great characters would be great. Um, here it falls short, unfortunately. Um, but I do find it quite exciting. And uh, one of the, the benchmark scene of the movie, the kind of, or the tentpole scene of the movie, I should say, is that. Uh, a lightsaber battle between uh, Qui-Gon, Obi-Wan, and Darth Maul. Darth Maul, guy gets very little screen time in the entire series, but he's very memorable for that scene alone, where he has like the double-edged lightsaber, and he's flipping around and doing kicks and jumps and whatever, and that motherfucker, spoiler alert, uh, he kills Qui-Gon, which was quite sad. I, I thought it was kind of a sad, you know, passing, where, at least in this part, when we're go when we're speaking of the, the prequel trilogy, any character that's not familiar from any of the other movies that would follow in, in terms of chronological order, uh, they risk dying. And uh, Qui Gon, you know, he was a good character and and he bit it, so that was kind of sad. Um, anyway, uh, what else? I mean, <laughs> I don't know. I I can't, you know, hugely knock the movie for its flaws it has flaws i mean it's it's not as good as the previous star wars movies but i think it it, it holds a very similar spirit uh in the action in the adventure um you know you can poke all the holes you want yes absolutely jar jar is annoying yes absolutely jake lloyd and his little yippies are, are just you know teeth grindingly bad um and, you know, kind of this, some of the stuff that they bring with the continuity. Totally unnecessary. Um, one thing I did, like, I liked um, C-3PO. I mean, not C-3PO, R2-D2's kind of origin. Like, we first meet him, and he's, like, saving the day. Like, he goes out on the ship when they're being attacked by the bad guys. And uh, he's a hero. He's like, oh, bring me that droid. Oh, what's his name? R2-D2, thank you. You are the best. And, you know, he's like, beep, beep. And I think that was a great introduction to uh, R2-D2. Uh, C-3PO, not so much. Anakin created C-3PO, built him from scratch. That's so fucking stupid. And all that stuff about mitochlorians um, and the fact that, you know, his mother, Anakin's mother, kind of talks about how he was immaculately conceived or something like that. And, and you're like, what? Okay, so they're going for a Jesus thing? And okay, um, but whatever. Um, pod race was cool, though. Um, so whatever. I mean, it, 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 in terms of visuals, in terms of special effects, I think this is just exquisite. It really is. I mean, this is a movie that you just uh, kind of immerse yourself in without, unfortunately, without... Uh, relating to the characters too much, but you're more kind of a fly on the wall, I guess. Um, but it is exciting, has a lot of great adventure scenes, and uh, I mean, a lot of familiar characters that we've come to love from the previous movies. We have Obi-Wan, and we have Yoda, which, uh, you know, for all the special effects in the movie, the worst special effect was actually the puppet Yoda, which it looked fucking horrible. Like the puppet Yoda was just revolting. And so and that's one thing I'm actually glad they cleaned up in, in the special or not special edition, but the Blu-ray version, they actually went back um, and uh, made him CGI like in the sequels. Um, so, I mean, there's a, a lot of crazy plot going on where, you know, George Lucas is trying to kind of allude to this phantom menace, this Darth Sidious, who's, Pulling the strings, meanwhile, we know it's uh, Ian McDermott, who's eventually going to become Emperor Palpatine from, from the other movies, and just trying to fill the piece a little bit, and that's ultimately second fiddle to the special effects, to 
the uh, grand grand uh, spectacle of, of the movie, which I think in terms of spectacle, it's as good as it gets in terms of story, uh, in terms of, well, not even story. I won't say story. I'll say characters. It just has weak characters. That's the biggest problem of the movie. So otherwise, I think it's a close to great movie. I, I really do. So I would rate Star Wars Episode One: The Phantom Menace, three and a half stars out of four. The visuals are just incredibly impressive. The action is incredibly fun. The huge undertaking from George Lucas is extremely, extremely impressive. And I think, personally, it's kind of... I think it's dismissed a little bit too much because it's just not as good as the other Star Wars movies, which is not. But I really like it. I think it keeps the same spirit in a lot of respects. In other respects, it falls short. But what can you do? Uh, so that's my review. Star Wars Episode One: The Phantom Menace. Uh, so I hope you invo- enjoyed watching. Uh, let me know what you think of the movie below. I'm curious to see if maybe time has been uh, perhaps a little bit kinder to the movie. Uh, comment, rate, subscribe, all that good stuff. Uh, be sure to visit Derek237.com. And until next time, may the Force be with you.